Wow, such a privilege to be with all of you tonight. And I was I was thinking during worship, um, what an opportunity to celebrate Jesus with all the host of heaven and all the angels and all the crazy creatures that God created, like the cherubim that have eyes all over their bodies and they're really weird. We would probably get very freaked out if we saw them. And we are joining the song of holy, joining the song of there's no one like you, joining the song that, God, you're the God that smiles, and you're smiling at me, and you're great, and you're holy and righteous, but you like me, whoa, that is such a privilege that we get to have, um, that we get to have in everyday life, we get to have as communities, and just as a whole corporate body, it's, it's a privilege. So I want to start my message this evening by reading something I found on the internet, <laughs> and I think it's great, and it's perfect for this whole sermon series that we're doing called Good News. And the sermon series on good news has two purposes. The first is that you would have good news. <laughs> There's so much bad news. And I grew up in every, I, I grew up in the church and I got into college and I was the prayer guy. So I would read my Bible. Listen to this. I would pray and read my Bible for three hours every single day when I was a freshman and sophomore in, in college. And I committed, I set my whole schedule up so that I could get three hours a day with God. And I did that for two straight years, and I still, the idea of evangelism made me cringe. I was like, no, thank you. I'll pray and read my Bible, but I don't have very much good news. I don't even know what to share. What would I share? I mean, I have all of these revelations in God, and I love the Bible, but there's not really good news on my lips to share. What? You guys, hundreds, maybe thousands of hours reading my Bible and praying, and I couldn't articulate the simple gospel of good news to share. As, a, as, as the church at large... We need good news and not religious go through the motions, study our Bible, pray, but then never actually have good news. Because you can, you can read your Bible and read in the Old Covenant and feel shame, guilt, and condemnation all day long because you're reading the Bible really good. Do we have good news? So that's the first goal that we would all have good news. <laughs> that's the goal of the series. And then secondly that we would know how to articulate the good news to people that don't know Jesus. Is that okay? Can we do that? We're continuing this journey, and I'm going to read my little internet thing that I found on the internet. You ready for it? This is a, this is a write-up of statements that's contrasting news, the good news that is kind of good news, and it's mostly mixed with the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and the New Covenant, and it kind of, it's what we grew up believing, many of us. And then it's contrasting that, and it's contrasting the mighty gospel, the really good news that's almost too good to be true. Did I talk to the 6 p.m. about Uangaleon last week? Yeah? Where I had you say that weird word, Uangaleon. It's in Greek, that means news that's almost too good to be true. News that's, it's like, are you sure that that's true? Because it's really, really good news. It's like, hey, you guys just won the lottery. It's like, you, you just won $100 million, and you're like, whoa, that's probably not true because it's news that's way too good to be true, right? That's how the gospel is. Okay, you ready for it? Are we ready? All right. The feeble gospel says you better love God. The mighty gospel declares he surely loves you. The feeble gospel preaches God can forgive you. The mighty gospel declares he already has. The feeble gospel says you need to get righteous, but the mighty gospel declares that in Jesus you already are righteous. The feeble gospel says you are the Lord's servant. The mighty gospel declares you are his beloved son. 
The feeble gospel says, God will bless you as you do your part. The mighty gospel declares, God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. The feeble, fees, little that. The feeble gospel drives you with law. The mighty gospel draws you with love. The feeble gospel says God gives and takes away. The mighty gospel declares God gives and now you are a giver. The feeble gospel says God is counting your sins. The mighty gospel says he has removed them as far as the east is from the west. The feeble gospel says you should do something for God. But the mighty gospel says look at what he's done for you. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 10 with me. As you're turning in your Bibles, I believe that it's important for us to understand that the most significant part of who you are and who every person is, is what they think about God and who God is and who they are. Those are the most important things about you is who is God and what do you believe he's like and who are you and wh- who do you think you are? Those are the two most important things. They're the, the most important things because they have everything to do with your identity. And if we don't understand, if we're followers of Jesus, if we don't understand identity, we are going to have a very difficult time doing the Great Commission. The Great Commission is this. Make disciples of every nation. So how are we going to lead people to discover what it looks like to follow Jesus if we don't know who we are and who he is? And what I want to do is, last week we talked about the basics of the gospel of Jesus, that God's perfect, that God loves us, and that God is just, and that he hates sin. God hates sin. And the whole reason why he hates sin is because sin destroys the ones that he loves. Sin destroys the objects of his affection. And so he came through a man, Jesus, and he undid all of the effects of sin. And he said, I am going to destroy sin and death because they're destroying the objects of my affection. And then we have a choice of how are we going to respond to what Jesus did. Everybody say this if you're willing. You don't have to say it. I'll say it first because I don't want you to say something if you don't want to say it, okay? I don't want you to repeat something just to repeat something. That, that'd be weird. So I'm going to have everybody say, I am a spirit, I have a soul, and I live in a body. You can repeat after me if you'd like. I am a spirit, a little bit louder. I have a soul, and I live in a body. My spirit is king. My soul is a servant. And my body is a slave to the king. You remember Adam and Eve, they're in the garden. And actually, before they're even in the garden, God is bending down, right? God the Father, he's bending down. And he's over what he just formed. He just formed Adam. And he's over and he's leaning over Adam and he breathes into Adam's nose. That's kind of funny, right? But God breathes into Adam's nose and he breathes. The same word for breath is spirit. He breathes his spirit, his image, and his nature into Adam. And Adam... (gasps) breathes his first breath. And it's the breath of God that he breathes. And the first eyes that that Adam sees are God's eyes. The first smile that Adam sees is God's smile. And they're face to face right there. Adam looks like his father. He has the image of his father. God breathed into Adam the spirit and his nature and what he was like, his likeness. A little bit later, what happens? Adam and Eve, they totally buy a lie in the garden. And so they eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but God gave them this warning, and he said, 
if you eat of the tree. This is what's going to happen. You're going to die, right? Adam and Eve, they eat of the tree. They're naked, hiding behind, I don't know which tree. It might even be the same tree that they just ate from. And as they're hiding, the question is this, what died? What died? Because their bodies didn't drop dead in the ground, to the ground, and their souls, they were still thinking, right? They still had brain waves going on. So what died? The breath in the Spirit of God that got breathed into them. Their spirit died. Their nature, the God nature in them died. And so we, we fast forward 4,000 years or so, and there we see Jesus. And he's having this conversation with a very religious guy named Nicodemus. And he says, Nicodemus, you have to get born again. You have to get born again. And Nicodemus says, I don't know how to get born again. I I don't know how to go into my mother's womb again. That's a little interesting. And then then he says, you, you, you should understand this. You're like a religious leader. How do you not understand this? See, Jesus is talking about you actually have to get born again of the Spirit, right? We talked about this at baptism service. You got to get born new on the inside. We just said you are a spirit. We We can't forget God is spirit. Jesus is a spirit, and he has a soul, and he lives in a body, And you are the same way as you are just like Jesus. You have a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. So, what happens when somebody gives their life to Jesus? They surrender and they believe the gospel. Then they get a brand new spirit, a new nature. But here's where the rubber meets the road. And this is the foundations. This is what I'm, I'm talking about. The foundations of the good news is so important. Because if we don't know how to discern between the spirit and the soul and the body, there's going to be a lot of confusion and there's going to be relationships that are going to get destroyed. Our jobs are going to be out of whack. Our attitude is going to be all messed up because our circumstances are going to dictate how everyday life happens. And so what we have to understand is what happened when we said yes to Jesus because we'll wake up the next morning or the person that we lead into relationship will wake up the next morning and they'll go, I don't feel different. What happens when you introduce somebody to Jesus and then the next morning they go, I thought I was supposed to be a new creation and I'm still fighting depression. I thought I was a new creation and the righteousness of God and that I was going to do greater signs and wonders than Jesus did, and I'm not experiencing what you're saying would be true for me. I'm I'm not acing the exams. I thought thought I'd be new, right? That's a little confusing. We have to understand The difference between spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, the core of who you are. Soul, mind, will, and emotions. Excuse me, mind, will, and emotions. Body, earth suit. (laughs) Hebrews 10, are we there in Hebrews 10? But what if I don't feel forgiven? What if I don't feel righteous? What if I don't feel clean? What if I don't feel pure? Well, what's true and what's not true? How does this all work? See, I believe that if the body of Christ, if, if people that love Jesus don't understand they're standing before God, there is going to be major problems, and there already is major problems. How many times have you ever heard, I know we're going to get into the Bible, I promise I'm going to read the Bible, okay? How many times have you had a conversation with somebody that doesn't know Jesus or hasn't given their life to Jesus, and they say something like this, yeah, um, I'm not really like a religious person or like the church type because I grew up going to church and pretty much everyone that I knew at church was a hypocrite. Have you heard that? I've heard that so many times. 
Basically, the church is full of hypocrites, and I actually have met nicer people and kinder people that don't know Jesus than the people that do know Jesus. How many times have you heard that? I've heard that so many times. The hypocrisy of the church hinges on us understanding spirit, soul, body, and this passage in the Bible. And our understanding of this truth, it has to land, and we have to understand it so that we can articulate to people that don't know Jesus and give some context to why there's so much hypocrisy. Hebrews 10, verse 11, I'm going to read this. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So the author's talking about the the Jewish sacrificial system. And so God enlisted priests, and their job was to make sacrifices to cover the sins of the people. Because remember, God is perfect. He's just. We're not. There needs to be some type of sacrifice to remove the sin. Well, There was never any chairs in the temple where they would do sacrifices. And so the priests would always be making sacrifices. The work was never done. They kept kept working and working and working, trying to deal with this big sin issue. What does the next verse say? But Christ, oh, I love that. But when Christ, but when Jesus, but when the Messiah, the King, had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God. So the priest could never sit down because the work was never finished, and then all of a sudden, God in the flesh, fully man, fully God, comes, he offers his whole life as a sacrifice, and then he goes in the grave, he comes and he shoots out of the grave, visits with people for 40 days, then he ascends into heaven from the Mount of Olives, and what does he do? He comes into the Holy of Holies, the place where you'd never sit down because the work, there's always more work to clean up the brokenness of the world. And what does Jesus do? He sits down. The work's finished. Scott Vanderwerf he teaches often. He's, many of you guys know Scott. He, last year, he was preaching the gospel, and he said something that stuck with me. He said, I don't know where we got this whole idea of, like, co-savioring, <laughs> where it's like, okay, I give my life to Jesus. I'm a Christian. I'm a born-again believer, but then my life looks like I kind of save. It's, it's a teamwork thing. So I believe that you save me, but then I don't necessarily believe that I'm forgiven until I remember my sins and then apologize for them and ask forgiveness for every single sin that I did. And so if I remember all of my sins and I do my part of apologizing for all of my sins, then God will forgive me. Wait a second. That looks like a lot of scurrying around in the Holy of Holies. That looks like doing some work to try to get forgiven when it says that the work was finished and then Jesus sat down. Let's continue to read. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying... This is the covenant I'll make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins no more and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of all of these sins, there is no longer a need for the offering for sin. So are you forgiven or are you not forgiven? When you come before God and you just screwed up and you just made a big mistake, what does God think about you? Are you sure about that? 
Do you fully know, are you confident what he thinks about you? If he makes, if you make that mistake, now pause, this is the holy God. This is the God that is perfect. This is the God that has billows of smoke and his voice is like lightning strikes and thunder And there's thousands of angels around him singing, you're totally other than, you're totally other than, you are mighty and glorious and righteous. And you think after you did that, you're forgiven? See, that's what the accuser of the brethren says all the time. The accuser comes in and says, how dare you? And you think you can just come and like sit on God's lap? (laughs) You can't do that. You and I both know that you're just dirty and you can't you can't approach God and be like just go on as if nothing happened. See, he's he sounds reasonable, doesn't he? The accuser, it kind of makes sense. But what we've done is we've taken what makes sense to our five senses. And we've made that our truth, rather than by grace through faith, believing that it's not based on feelings, but it's actually through faith, right? Because your feelings are going to tell you, your, our feelings are going to tell us so many things. Our circumstances are going to be rough, and our feelings about our circumstances, we ask each other all the time, how are you feeling? How many of our spouses, if you're a good spouse... How are you feeling today? How are you doing? And most of the time, we're answering, yeah, mm, uh, 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 I don't know. (laughs) It's kind of been a rough day, and we start talking about our circumstances, right? Because most of our lives are in the five senses. I remember Dan Moeller, he said, it's all sensual. It's it's, It's all the senses, you know. He talked about how we're living our lives based on our five senses and our feelings and emotions rather than on faith and the truth. Let's keep on reading. The Bible is really good. (laughs) Therefore, because the work has been done, because there's forgiveness for all of our sins, past, present, and future, I I know I'm not reading the Bible yet, but I'm just (laughs) paraphrasing what we just read. Time out. Jesus dies 2,000 years ago. We sin yesterday. We forget to apologize for our sin. Are we forgiven or are we not forgiven? We're forgiven. Jesus died and swept out all of the sins of the whole world. The choice is if the world will receive the forgiveness, but they're forgiven. Will they receive, and then what this sermon series is all about is receiving and then releasing. Okay, I'm going to read now. Verse 19, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, Look at verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You know, when I think about verse 19, therefore, brothers, since we have, been, we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, I think about um, what confidence for a child looks like. You know, where, remember last week I talked about Jesus and he, co- he comes into the courtroom of heaven 
And he's just like, boom, boom. And he just like walks in like crazy, right? I don't know what happened here. He walks in and he's just so confident as the Savior. And he comes in and he makes the sacrifice before the Father. Do you remember that? I just pictured us. And we're kind of looking a little bit like Jesus. And we smell like Jesus to the Father. And we start going in to the throne room. There's like the, the green emerald rainbow. There's the, the cherubim and all of the angels. And they're all just singing holy, holy. And we just start walking past them. It's like, yeah, you're in the nosebleeds. Yeah, I'm going down. Now I'm on the floor level. And I am just charging the, the platform, right? And I'm going, I'm going after, I'm going to sit on the throne. And all of a sudden, it's just... And there's so much joy and confidence. How do you come before God? Morning, noon, night, after you screw up, after you sin, after you miss the mark, are you confident? Do you have full assurance? Or do you base your experience in God on what you feel like? on your soul, on your emotions? Or do you have boldness and courage and confidence? Knowing that you're defined not by what you feel, but by what he did. Turn to Romans 12 with me. See, your spirit has been justified. If you've given your life to Jesus, he died for you, and you've said yes, and you've given him your life, your spirit gets justified. That means as if, just as if you've never sinned before, before God. That's what justified means. I stand before the perfect God just as if I never sinned before, just like Jesus stands before God. That's awesome. Can I just pause and say this? Every single one of us have always wanted to know someone that loved us unconditionally, that was patient, that was kind, that kept no record of wrongs, that didn't keep score in our relationship, that loved us, was joyful, was generous, self-controlled. Every single one of us wants a relationship with someone like that, right? We've all been longing for it since we were born. God does not want to hide himself. He doesn't want to hide himself from any of you. He went, so, he went so out of his way that he actually became a baby, got born in a cave, and then lived everyday life as a carpenter for 30 years. And then for three years, he had a ministry showing what God's heart really is. And it's all because he loves every single one of you. I know I'm talking to somebody tonight. Maybe you've heard this good news, but there's some of us haven't heard the good news that God actually loves you, and he's not, he didn't come because you're a dirty, rotten sinner. He came because you were worth so much to him. He came because he never lost sight of your value, even when you were at your worst. Even when all of us probably have laid on our beds in the fetal position and cried and wept and felt broken on the inside and thought, where are you, God? And he's saying, I've come that you would know me and have relationship with me. I see you even in your brokenness, and I love you. Even when you're at your worst, I never lost sight of your value. And I wanted to give my whole life, lay my life down on the cross so that you would have relationship with somebody like that.
The question is, how do you respond to that type of love? Do you ignore it? Do you move on with life as if, hey, it's just another day? Or do you respond and say, I give myself fully into a relationship with someone like this? If you really love me that way, I want, you to, I want to give you my life. I'm talking to someone tonight. I, I feel like there's, there's lies that are coming up, though, around, but you didn't love me enough to stop all of those awful things in my life. All of those horrible things that I've suffered in when I was a kid and when I was an adult, you didn't stop any of those. If you're God, you would have stopped it. If you're powerful, you would have stopped it. And if you're a God of love, you would have stopped it. And there's an accusation towards God, and probably in religion, all you've heard is, well, he's God, and he knows better, and God's in control. Lies. It's not true. It's not true. Sin entered the picture with Adam and Eve. I'm going totally off my notes because God is doing something right now. Listen, God, what happened in the garden? Adam and Eve fall. They sin. Brokenness enters the world. All of creation is brought to futility. It's a broken world and there's broken people. And so when somebody sins against you, God could not stop it because this is what happened. God gave Adam and Eve free will to do as they please. He gave them the privilege and the ability to love or to not love. And he wasn't going to control Adam and Eve and say, you're going to love me and you're going to be a robot. And you're not going to have any free choice. No, he said, you're free to love if you want to or to not love if you want to. To obey if you want to or not obey if you want to. Adam and Eve, they choose to not love and to not obey. And every single person that's born of a woman is born broken. Born needing love. Born existing to try to get love from us. Not give love because we've received it. And so there's natural disasters because Adam and Eve were meant to have governance and dominion over the earth. And they gave it up. And then you, we wonder, man, how, how could God let this person do that to me? When all along the way, he gave them freedom and his heart is breaking with compassion that that happened. And he hates all the destruction of sin. And he said, I can't stand this. I'm sending my son. I'm going to bring restoration. I'm going to bring wholeness. I'm going to bring wholeness to people. And these people are meant to re represent me. But then what hurts the most is when the representatives of who is supposed to be God don't know who they are and they have a wrong perspective on, on what God has said about them. And so then they start sinning against people and judging people because they don't know the gospel. They don't know the good news. The good news that Jesus laid his life down for, that we would all hear, is that if you give your life to Jesus and you stand before him, he sees you as righteous and perfect and holy. But if you don't feel that and you're a Christian, you feel shame, guilt, and condemnation. You feel shame because you think that you're still a sinner. You feel, feel guilt because you think, I've messed up and I've messed up, and I'm not forgiven. And you believe that you're condemned because you're guilty. And you think it's a co-savior thing, like I have to do something in order for God to be happy with me. <laughs> and that's why you, or people that love Jesus, but don't know who they are, 
bring shame, guilt, and condemnation onto everybody around them because they feel that. And I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that their shame, guilt, and condemnation got projected onto you because that's religion, but it's not truth. And it's not the good news. It's really bad news. And it destroys people's lives. And I'm sorry for all the destruction that that has brought to your life. As you've been judged, as you've been shamed, as there's been guilt that has just been cast on you, that's not the Lord. It's the enemy, and it's the accuser. That's what the devil and all of his demons do all day long is they accuse us. Romans 12 I'm just fill, I'm filled with so much zeal, you guys, around this because we're giving credit to God for things that are actually things that Satan and the demons have done, and we're giving credit to God for things that fallen humans have done, and we're giving credit to things, and we're calling them natural disasters or works of God that are actually just because all of creation is broken because sin entered into the picture. And I'm full of zeal around it because it's actually deceiving us and it's pushing us away from God and we don't want anything to do with a God like that. I don't want anything to do if you're a sovereign God like that and you're controlling every little piece of history. I don't want anything to do with you because you killed my children and my wife died in a car accident and I got molested as I was a young kid and you are the one micromanaging all of it. That is not what the Bible teaches and it's not who God is. We've been deceived by an enemy that calls good evil and evil good. And he's the God of love. Worship team, you guys can come to the front. <clears throat> I just appreciate all of, uh, I'm, I'm not mad at anybody, okay? <laughs> I'm really not, I'm not mad at anybody. I'm mad at the enemy, and I promise if this is your first time, I'm a really nice guy. <laughs> but, uh, um, I'm just full of zeal that, that the enemy has lied to us since we were little kids. And I see that there's a war over my five-year-old. There's a war over my three-year-old. And if I wasn't mature in my faith, being able to cut off lies off of them at a young age. I know that many of us didn't have parents that were even aware of the war over our own lives. And I'm just so full of zeal that we, we would be aware that there's a war over your mind. There's a war over how we think. Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse two, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. If you've given your life to Jesus, your spirit is justified, just as if you've never sinned. Your soul is in process, though. <laughs> That's why there's so much hypocrisy, right? Because people's souls are in process. And all of us know that our bodies are not perfect, and they're not glorified. There's a day coming when Jesus is going to come back and he's going to give us glorified new bodies. But until that day, we're in this process. The process of renewing our minds. 
renewing our minds. Look at this. In verse 1, it talks about spiritual worship. What that means is our bodies. It says our bodies are to be living sacrifices. In other words, our bodies are instruments of worship. Like your earth suit is an instrument of worship for God. Just how God created the cherubim with eyes all over the place, their bodies were meant to be worship instruments. And all of us were created to be worship instruments. Our body, your body, your hands, your eyes, your face, your lips, every part of you was meant to be a worship instrument for God. But how? How is that? How do you do that? Verse 2, it says, we renew our minds with truth. Jesus talked about in the, in the Gospels, he said, they're going to worship me in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? Well, I don't know. What does that mean? You're given a new spirit when you say yes to Jesus. Holy Spirit comes inside of you. Worship in spirit. And then you renew your mind with truth. And then your body is an instrument for worship. Spirit, soul, body. Let's all stand. I'm not going to do some dramatic altar call. Uh, let's all just spread out throughout the room. If, if you'd like, you can spread into the aisles. If you want to spread f- forward, you can. Um, I'm not going to just try to stir ourselves up as a, as a community, but I just want to say this. Um, this is an authentic moment for you if you want to respond to the truth that God shared tonight through me. It's not, I'm not like, I, I just feel like the, more than half of my message was not planned and it was the Holy Spirit highlighting some of you in the room and it's not weird to respond to whatever he wanted to speak to you. And you can respond. And what I want to do is encourage you to actually step forward Somewhere, if you want to step to the altar and just say, like, in this area, and you want to say, God, that was for me, and I receive your truth, and I, I, I give myself over to the truth, and I, I declare that you're the healer, and you're going to heal all of these things in my life. You're going to bring restoration, and you're going to change the way that I'm thinking about you. So I just want to encourage you, just respond to him tonight. And for all of us, it's going to be different how you respond. But some type of response to the gospel. Let's just do that. So, Lord, we just trust you. And we give you our our hearts and our lives. We say that you are good. And we settle that in our hearts. We give our lives to you. Pastor Ben reminded me that we are going to take communion tonight. (laughs) And so uh, there's communion if you'd like to take it up at the front. And that communion is a celebration of the goodness of God. It's the celebration that God gave everything to reveal his love for you. It's not a time to focus on sin, but it's a time to remind ourselves of the goodness of the good news of Jesus, that he really is good. And he really did give his body and his blood so that we could have relationship with Jesus. So at will, whenever during worship, just come at will and at random and we're going to celebrate communion.